What happens when your soulmate turns out to be a Bigfoot? And then we take a look at a story of two boats crashing on the exact same island at the same time. And depending on which boat you're on, you either live or get eaten. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. I want to start this episode off with a correction. A long time ago, I don't remember what episode it was on, I said that I was not a fan of Post Malone. That is wrong now. That kid slaps, dude. Like, I've been listening to the radio a lot. Post, if you're listening to this podcast, I apologize for saying that I didn't like your music. It's pretty good. It's really good. Okay. Now that that's out of the way, now that that correction is out of the way, I want to give a shout out to our newest Patreon supporter, Dennis Kirikoff. Dennis Kirikoff, thank you so much for supporting the show. It really, really means a lot. And if you can't support the Patreon, that's fine too. Just help get the word out about the show. We also have a merch store, and you can jump on the Minecraft server. That doesn't help me in any way, shape, or form, but it's fun to play with you guys. But Dennis, let's go ahead. We're going to start off in the Dead Rabbit Dirigible. We haven't taken that for a while. We're going to take a nice, slow trip from the United States to Russia, which is actually where Dennis is from. I actually didn't plan this, so this is perfect. He's like, he has to fly all the way out to America. Now he's all he's all tired. He's slowly flying the dirigible. I'll fall asleep on the controls. Wake up, wake up! Don't fall asleep. We're about to hit something. What? We're like 10,000 feet in the air. Yeah, yeah, I just didn't want you to sleep at the wheel. So eventually... After 10 cups of coffee and us constantly pestering him, we finally fly out to Russia. It's the mid-1800s. And we're flying over Mongolia is really the area where he's like, I thought we were flying to Russia. I was like, yeah, yeah. we're flying over Russia is what I meant to say. He's like, oh, man, I was going to check my mail. Flying over. It's the mid-1800s. Now, there's a Russian author named Ivan Turgenev. Now, he reportedly told this story I'm about to tell you to a guy named Guy, that's actually his name, Guy D. Guy D. Mopezin. So he's the one who tells the story to us. Basically, it's a game of old-fashioned telephone. Before telephones were invented, this was a game of telephone. I also saw a note that this guy, Guy, is this thing? This Guy D. Mopezin, he was considered the master of the short story. And on Wikipedia, they said his first story was considered his greatest work. That would suck, dude. The first thing you ever did was the best thing ever. And he wrote like 200 stories. Everyone's like, eh, it's not as good as your first story. Anyways, so th- that's why he had to tell us when he's like, no, 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 no. I'll tell you a really cool story. We're going back in time. There's this guy named Ivan who's also an author. But when he's not writing, he's hunting. So he's out in the woods. He has, it's in the mid 1800s. So he has like a musket and stuff. He's like, oh, I better make this shot. Otherwise, it'll take me two days to load a new one. He's blowing stuff up. And then he's like, oh. Man, that sure was hard work, killing all those animals. I think I'm going to take a swim. So he sits there and he takes off his little wooly cap, his wooly jacket, his wooly pants. He's totally naked. And he's like, ah, nothing like a brisk Mongolian morning to really wake you up. He jumps into the river. And he's swimming there. Now we're standing on the shore and Dennis looks over and he goes, did you really bring bring me out here to watch a naked guy swim? And I'm like, wait for it splashing around he's swimming he's swimming he's swimming in the river and he feels something on his shoulder you kind of shake it off you know maybe it's a spider maybe it's a spider right and then he thinks wait no why would a spider be in the middle of the river and he slowly turns around and he sees a big old hairy hand on his shoulder and he's like i should turn around a little more fast but i'm going to slowly turn around for dramatic sake and then he starts to see a a hairy wrist and he's like oh this isn't good He's still slowly turning around. He sees a hairy arm. He's like, I'm going to turn around a little bit more. The rest of it better not be hairy. He turns, and there's a Bigfoot behind him. But not just any Bigfoot. It's a woman Bigfoot. Has a big old smile on its face. And a look in her eye. She's ready for some loving. Now, I don't know about you. First off, I'm not a swimmer. But that really has nothing to do with this. If I was walking through the woods or just sitting at home, and I felt a hand on my shoulder. I'm turning around much quicker than Ivan did. But if I saw like a Bigfoot lady and she looked like she wanted to have sex with me, I'd be a little flattered. I'd be a little curious. <laughs> but I would be, I'd leave, right? Right? I mean, actually, now that you think about Well, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you'd leave. <laughs> you'd leave, right? Because, like, it's an animal. 
That's actually not... Well, no, is that the only thing stopping me from banging Bigfoot? If it was like a Bigfoot and she had already attended college and I knew she was like a rational person, she's all like wearing glasses and long hair and it's all done up. No, I'm like, if, Bigfoot, if she didn't have glasses, I'm like, what? You don't have glasses. I'm not having sex with you, Bigfoot lady. If you saw a female Bigfoot and you knew that it wasn't an animal, it was just like this... <laughs> it was just... A, hum- a hairy human. I guess am I saying, would I have sex with a hairy human, female? Yes, I would. I don't even know why I have to qualify that. But if it was a monstrous beast, if it had the brain of a monster, I'd beat feet, right? And you don't know. Plus, he's in a river, so he doesn't have much time. To- he's going to be like, hmm, can I do an IQ test on this thing? He panics, right? He's not as progressive as I am. He starts swimming away from this thing. It's almost like blind fear, and he's splashing in the water. And then he hears it swimming behind him. Splash, 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 splash. Over the raging river. It might have just been a brook. I don't know. But anyways, as they're dodging rocks, boulders are coming down. I'm hot lava shooting. I'm making it so more dramatic. He's swimming. The creature's swimming after him. He jumps up. Now, he's totally naked, right? And he's thinking, there are my clothes. There's my gun. But right behind me is this giant, hairy woman. And he takes another look. He's like, maybe. No, no, no. (laughs) He blows that thought up. Should I grab the clothes? Should I grab the gun? But then he thinks, it's a musket. It's going to take me two weeks to load it. He takes off running in the woods. And he hears a squealing. (laughs) Jump out of the water. Not the sound effect. That's Bigfoot jumps out of the water and is making that noise. Female Bigfoot is now chasing him through the woods. (laughs) Apparently, it's the Crypt Keeper. He's running, he's running, and then, like, oh no, which way do I go? I guess there's only one way to go, it's a forest, I can go straight. He sees a young boy in the distance, and he's running, he's running, he doesn't know why, but he's thinking, I have a feeling that young boy is going to solve all of my problems, and is he, oh, probably, because whatever's behind me will eat the child, and then I can definitely get away. He's running, he's running, and the creature's right behind him, and then the kid pulls out a whip, and straight Indiana Jones style, whoosh, starts whipping Lady Bigfoot. She stops in her tracks, right? I think a whip will stop anyone. She's holding her arm. She turns and she runs in the other direction. And the kid's like nonplussed about the whole thing. He basically rolls a cigarette afterwards, smokes it, and Ivan's completely out of breath. Now he's embarrassed because he doesn't have any clothes on and he was being chased by a female Bigfoot. So Ivan walks up to the little kid. The little kid's standing there with his whip. Bigfoot ladies running off, still squealing. Ivan's like, yo, what was that? Like, you were just standing there waiting for her. And little kid looks at, looks up at Ivan, rolls a little cigarette, puts it in his mouth. He's not making kissy faces. He's smoking the cigarette. He goes, yeah, we're not scared of her around here. Just just normal. (laughs) Ivan's like, what do you mean normal? Little kid's like, tell you what, why don't you go to the village? They'll take care of you. We'll get you some clothes. They'll figure stuff out. You go, you know, you're getting kind of weird just standing in the forest naked. Just go, go. So he go. Ivan goes to the village, and he walks in, and he goes, guys, guys, you won't believe what just happened to me. And everyone's, everyone's sitting around smoking cigarettes. Uh, let me guess. Let me guess. Uh, apparently something involved you taking your clothes off, so I'm not for sure what that is, but we imagine that you probably uh, met the Bigfoot lady. Taking drag. Everyone takes a jacket of the cigarette at the exact same time. Yeah! Why is nobody shocked that... You're more shocked that I'm naked than the fact that there's a Bigfoot lady walking around. And he's like, and there was a little kid out there too with the whip. They're like, oh yeah, Jerry. Jerry, I was wondering where Jerry's at. He's supposed to be doing his chores. Uh, yeah, whatever his name was. He he wasn't scared at all. He just started whipping this big old monster lady. And they're like, yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Mongolia, dude. They said that the woman was actually a local crazy woman living in the woods. That she wasn't a monster. She she was just some tall, hairy, squealing woman who they have to deal with from time to time, a.k.a. run her out of town with whips. And Ivan's like, uh... He's a little dicey on that. He does eventually go get his clothes. He's not naked when he's telling this story to Guy years later. He's like, and that's the reason why I'm naked in front of you right now. And everyone's like, what? It's a weird story. He did eventually go get his clothes and his gun. He thought about it, and he goes, that doesn't really make sense. That doesn't really make sense. But over time, he started to go, well, maybe it was just a crazy lady. But when Guy retells the story later on, he goes, yeah, I even started to kind of believe that explanation, but this is the last line of Guy's story. Yet, 
It was known in the 19th century that people do not get covered with thick hair all over their bodies, even if they lived alone in the woods. So Guy believes that it was some sort of... Obviously, the word Bigfoot wasn't around in the 1800s in France or England or anything like that. You would have had Mountain Man or Yowie or any other word, but the the term Bigfoot is fairly new. Sasquatch, things like that, from people who'd been traveling around the world hearing these stories. But Ivan, in the end, believes the story. I think, but Guy doesn't. I think it's interesting because you would want to... He has a poster that says, I want to believe. It's just a picture of a hairy woman, like reading the newspaper. You would want to believe that it was just some hairy chick chasing you down, as opposed to an actual Bigfoot. Because what would that say about you? Yes, I did say that I would have mixed feelings about going on a date with a Bigfoot, but... Like, if an ugly human woman is attracted to you, at least she's human. If you're attracting (laughs) mythological creatures that are known for their size, strength, and smell, what does that say about you? Ivan's like, at night, he's like, no, it was a human, it was a human, it was just a human, it was just a human girl, just a hairy human girl, as as he's rocking back and forth in his bed. And Guy pops up in the window, no, it was Bigfoot, Bigfoot, Bigfoot likes you. I don't know, I think I'd be flattered if a female Bigfoot had a crush on me. I don't know what I would do if she was a rational, consenting, adult Bigfoot. I might at least take her out to the movies. But wouldn't you? I mean, like, you're curious, obviously, right? You're like, hey, everyone just now goes, no, it's it's Bigfoot. It's Bigfoot. (laughs) Anyways, Dennis is like, can we hop in the carpenter copter? We can, good sir. We can. Let's go ahead and hop in that carpenter copter. I'm waving goodbye to my new girlfriend. She's like, blowing kisses at me. I'm like, see, she's cool. We're taking off. We're leaving behind Mongolia. Dennis, fly that carpenter copter. We are headed out to the Auckland Islands. (laughs) We're going back to the year 1864. This is actually pretty much just a few years after this uh, Bigfoot and Love story. (laughs) We're going to the Auckland Islands. There's a boat called the Grafton. (laughs) It's a whaling vessel, and we're looking down at it, and it's just getting beat up by the water. Water's punching it. The water forms a hand, and it's ripping it up. They're like, what's going on? We thought we knew physics, but apparently not. Water's doing a body slam on it. It's getting bad, and it's midnight. And Captain Musgrave is on the deck. He's watching these waves come over. (laughs) The black sea in front of him, and he sees an island way too close to where the boat should be. And he's like, well... Either we move, the island moves, and we can't move with these waves. The island's not going to move because it's part of the globe. The boat crashes into the island. He starts giving out orders as the boat's taken on water. Grab the food, the tools, the gun, the ammo, materials. Let's start getting whatever we can off this boat now before it sinks. They make it to the island, and there's a ton of animals there. And luckily, they have all the materials they need. They got their guns. They can hunt seals. They're shooting birds. They're eating fish. They secure a clean source of water. They build a really quick shelter out of all the debris of the boat. And then they start to build a permanent one. They're like, you know what, this is, this is a great shelter and all, but we might be here for a while. Let's build ourselves as something that will stand up to the elements. So under the command of Captain Musgrave, they build like a house of stone and timber. at a chimney and a desk. Basically, I just imagine he's sitting on a bunch of coconuts... Everyone has. Everyone had their own little bed. They're just sitting there and he's writing letters. Dear Margaret, it's the 14th day we've been trapped on this island and I already live in a better house than I have at any time in my life. It's amazing here. I wish you could join us. It's a tropical paradise. The captain, you know, to pass time, he starts reading classes. Everyone's sitting around. They all have, they salvaged a bunch of glasses. They're like, I feel smart now. I feel super smart now. The one guy fashions a chess set. They're making dominoes. They start making beer. And then eventually they go, listen, this is, this is pretty awesome. This is almost like a working vacation, but we should try to like figure some way off this island. Everyone's like, oh, and he's like, I know, I know, I know. It's pretty dope. We do have this beer, right? Like, you guys all do know how to read now, but we eventually should probably get back to civilization. Everyone's like, yeah, I guess they made a raft that could carry three of them. So that crash happened on January 3rd, 1864. On July 24th, 1865, is when they launched the raft. So they were there for about a year and a half, almost. The raft goes out. They end up seeing a rescue ship. They flag it down. The rescue ship comes in. 
And everyone's like, just kind of chill and rescue ships. Like, do you want to be rescued? And they all look at each other They're like, yeah, I guess. Because I have to, right? You know, we're running out of food. We're not. We have all these seals. We're breeding seals. They started wearing seal skin clothing. And they go, yeah, sure, let's go. So they get on the boat, and the boat starts going away. And on the other side of the island that they're trapped on, they see a plume of smoke. They're kind of looking at each other. And they knew the island was deserted. They go, we should probably send another ship over to check that out, because there might be more survivors, right? This is one of those interesting stories where everything comes down to basically a handful of decisions. It's 1864. It's May 11th. So we're going back in time. This is five months after... The Grafton had crashed. On the other side of the island, there's a boat under the control of Captain George Delgarno. It's 2 a.m. Waves are crashing over the boat. Ah, it's super dark. You can't see anything. Why couldn't this happen in the middle of the day? Ah, or not happen at all. Waves are crashing over the boat. It's 2 a.m. in the morning. And the captain goes, you, to d- d- do something. And you, uh, I don't know, just walk around in circles. I don't know what to do. And then you had the first mate being like, no, 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 don't walk around in circles, you idiot. Walk around in an octagon. And every the crew is completely panicked. They're getting contradictory orders. It's super dark. Everyone's wet. Which they kind of expected that on the boat, but they didn't expect it to crash. In the panic, four people drown as the boat's going down. And there is a guy in the sick bay laying in bed uh, what's going on, guys? I just woke up from a deep nap. Why is the water up to my nose? They don't even rescue him. Six people drown, and one man didn't even have a chance. He was in sick bay. They get to shore, and their boat is still sinking, and they go, okay, here's the plan. When the sun comes up, when we can see what's going on, we'll go back. We'll get the food. We'll get the supplies. We'll get the guns and the ammo and all that stuff. We'll be able to shoot seals and shoot birds and build a temporary house and all that stuff. Maybe you get one of those chess sets you've always been talking about. Yippee! But in the morning, we'll go out there. They were able to get a couple pounds of biscuits and some salted pork and had just enough wood to build a little lean-to shelter. But by the time morning came, the boat had completely submerged. The boat was sinking when they left it. So by the time the morning came, they're like, oh, that was kind of a restful night. I had dreams of people drowning, but I wasn't one of them, so I'm okay. Let's go salvage the... It's just boats boats gone. Like, I don't know what they were expecting. But anyway, so they do have some food. They have a couple pieces of wood they built a little lean-to. They had two packs of matches. And they're like, okay, these matches are wet. So let's dry them out. Let's set them out in the sun. Because we'll probably need them later. So let's start. Let's spend a long time starting this fire. They're rubbing. The guy, you know, doing the stick rub thing. Trying to, you hear my hands rubbing together? I'm going to start a fire just doing the sound effect. They start a little fire. Oh, this is awesome. So the matches that they'll use later to make it easier in the future are sitting out in the sun, and they go, whoa, 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 I got a better idea. Those matches. Sure, we can leave them out in the sun, and they'll dry very slowly, or we can put the matches next to the fire, which is hot, right? Fire's hot. We'll put the matches next to the fire, and the matches will dry. Matches <laughs> catch on fire. The matches catch on fire. So they're like, well, okay, there goes that. Now we just have to not leave this fire. This little fire we've built will be totally fine. May 11th, 1864. Four days after the boat sinks, they're already out of food. And they really don't have a way to hunt. They don't have any of the guns that Captain Musgrave was able to get. I think you can kind of see (laughs) where this is going. They see a cliff. They see a 2,000-foot cliff. And they go, we should probably climb up the cliff. And start looking for food. Because maybe there's they see these delicious seals floating around, but they can't get them. And they go, maybe there's like pigs on the island or something like that. So let's climb up the cliff and we'll go looking. Now, there's one guy who's like, oh, I'm too sick to move. I'm just going to lay here. He's faking it. He's like, I got bit, bit by a seal. I got the seal disease. I can't move. I'm slowly turning into a seal. I can't move. So anyways, he's, he's not faking. He's actually very, very ill. But this, everyone goes... To climb up the cliff. They've run out of food. Let's climb up this cliff. Now, one guy says, I'll stick around on the beach. I'll stay with this sick dude. You climb up there. And when you find food, just bring the food back. And everyone's like, oh, yeah, it's a great idea. Is their eyes shift from side to side? <laughs> they climb up the cliff. They do find pigs up there. And they immediately just spear it. And they're like, oh, wait. <laughs> we got to cook it. Sorry. Rubbing the sticks together. Rubbing the sticks together. Eventually, you start a fire. Now, the dude on the beach... Apparently, apparently, he lives in a Looney Tune cartoon because from a 2,000-foot cliff, he smells 
cooking pork. I can just imagine like little wavy lines and it makes it makes a finger and it's like doo 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 doo. It like goes under his nose, it's tickling his nose. The guy's sitting next to this dude on the beach and he smells the food cooking up there and he hasn't eaten in a while. And he's like, hey buddy, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go climb up this cliff and I'm gonna go eat some of this food. I'll be right back, bro. I'll be right back. And the dude on the beach obviously knows <laughs> knows the jig is up. No man, don't leave me, don't leave me. His buddy, though, I couldn't climb up a 2,000-foot cliff to, to save my life, but apparently just the smell of bacon this guy is able to scramble up in. No one ever went back to help the guy on the beach. He dies on the beach. They're eating the pig. They're eating roots. They're basically eating really whatever they can get their hands on. And while this is going on, the body count starts to rise. They eventually made it to another whole different part of the island. They never went back for that guy. You started to have disagreements in the group. People are dying of exposure. Seven people go, you know what? We're going to break off on our own. We're going to go and we're going to try to find food on our own. You have They're at each other's throats. And everyone knows what's coming, right? Everyone has the same vision. They're looking, they're talking to their buddies, and they're imagining chickens standing there. They're imagining broiled chickens standing there. Again, like a Looney Tune cartoon. They know they... They're able to eat roots. They're able to catch a pig every once in a while. But every seaman knows cannibalism is not, not far from now. So seven people go, you know what? We're going to leave this group. We're going to strike out on our own. And Captain Del Garno goes, whatever. Like, the less people we have to feed, the better. Those seven people walk out into the jungle. They're never seen again. Their remains are never found. No settlement is ever found. They're gone from the face of the earth. They get to another beach. They've walked all the way from one side of the island to another. They get to another beach. They find some delicious seals. They're actually able to, at this point, at this point, I'm sure they are very hardy men who are great with a spear because they've now been fighting their way across the island. Spear and pigs, you got a lot of practice. Now you just have to, what is, what is a seal but a slippery pig? A more slippery pig. People are still dying off though. Three months later, People are still dying off. They can't get enough food. They're dying off one by one by one by one. They end up making a canoe out of seal skin. So definitely they've ranked up their experience level as far as seal killing goes. They put a lot of points into their hunting skill. They have a seal skin canoe. They go to another neighboring island. It's full of rabbits. And they're like, why couldn't we have crashed on this island? They're eating rabbits. They're having an okay time. May 20th, 1865, more than one year since they crashed, a boat happens to come in on repairs. Sees a bunch, sees a bunch of dudes standing there. Uh, you won't believe the year we had. A bunch of people died, and we left a couple on the boat, and we left one on the beach to die, but we're alive. And the rescue crew, again, they were just there to make repairs on their boat. They're like, oh, that's awesome. And from what it sounds like, nobody resorted to cannibalism. Everyone's eyes kind of shift from side to side again. One of them did, actually. These two guys were fighting. One of the guys falls, cracks his head open, and dies. And the buddy's like, well, I guess I won that argument. And he starts eating his buddy. So they did resort to cannibalism. One guy resorted to cannibalism, according to their story. And as that boat was leaving, on May 20th, 1865, they were leaving... They got back home, and that was a huge story because, obviously, cannibalism at sea always gets headlines. It's just the most barbaric practice, and it's the story of survival. And it really was juxtaposed, because what happened was by the time they get back, so they're leaving on May 20th, 1865. And then in July of 1865, the Grafton shows up, and they're all like super, they have like three-piece suits made out of seal skins. They're, they've gained muscle. They're super fit. They're like, oh, yeah, dude, that island's totally dope, dude. I mean, if you prepare for it, if your boat's sinking, you know, just grab what you want. And Del Garno's like, oh, man, I should have thought, thought of that. You have these two ship crashes at the same time, roughly the same time. Two completely different captains. And what boat you're on depended on whether or not it was a vacation paradise or a hellscape where at least one person ate one other person. But remember, it was in July when the Grafton was being rescued and they saw the smoke coming from the other part of the island. So that means that that group of seven people were definitely still alive when both rescue ships showed up. Signaling for help? Or was it a fire destroying their camp? Was there a war over who would be eaten first? 
Nobody knows. Nobody has ever found their remains on that island. I find that story really interesting because it is a story of survival, but I find that story very interesting. I think it's something that we can relate to our own lives. I tell people, and this is a Bible verse. I didn't make this up, but I, I always tell people this. Steel sharpens steel. Who you hang out with, who you have company with, is a very important thing to how you are. And Steel sharpens steel. Two great people will make each other greater. I don't hang out with scrubs. I do not hang out with scrubs. I hang out with people as good as me or better. And I tell my friends that. Steel sharpens steel. Steel sharpens steel. You hang out with the people that you want to be like. You, you hang out with the people who are better than you. And you continue to try to be great every single day. Steel sharpens steel. Depending on... You had these two different captains. But they weren't different captains just on that particular day. Those crews would have been completely different. And if the crew members on Del Garno's ship had been on Musgrave's ship, I believe that over the course of that journey, they would be better crewmen. They would not panic. The, cir- the circumstances were the same. But because you had different crews, it wasn't just the captain, because you had different crews. They had one disagreement with Musgrave. They had one disagreement when they were playing chess for a while. People started getting in fights over chess. So Musgrave just threw the chess set away and goes, if you guys can't be nice. Everyone's like, yeah, that's probably a pretty good idea. Steel sharpens steel. You want to hang out with the people who are going to make you a better person. Because while this may seem like an extreme example, you never know who you're going to be in a crazy situation with. And it might not even be this insane. But you never know when life is going to throw you a curveball. And when you turn to those people around you for assistance, the people you've gathered throughout your life to help you, are they going to take you on a fun adventure that everybody learns from? Or are you guys going to start cannibalizing each other in a metaphorical sense? Steel sharpens steel. Who you hang out with not only determines if you survive, but if you thrive. And if, in the end... You are a better person wearing a snazzy seal skin suit. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash DeadRabbitRadio. Twitter is at DeadRabbitRadio. DeadRabbitRadio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys. (laughs) 